Greetings, and welcome to the Peace Operations Training Institute's webinar series. We are committed to bringing essential, practical knowledge to military personnel, police, and civilians working toward peace worldwide. To explore all the e-learning training programs offered by the Peace Operations Training Institute, you are invited to view our website at www.peaceopstraining.org. The Peace Operations Training Institute would like to thank the nations and the ministries of foreign affairs that provide the support so essential for the success of our webinars and all the programs we offer. These are Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. In this webinar, Dr. Harvey Langholz, the Executive Director of the Peace Operations Training Institute, interviews Dr. Anjanette Roska, previously a Gender and Security Fellow with the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control for Armed Forces, and more recently, Executive Director of Transpositions Consulting and the author of the POTI course, Preventing Violence Against Women. Greetings. I'm Harvey Langholz, the Executive Director of the Peace Operations Training Institute, coming to you today from POTI headquarters in Williamsburg, Virginia, in the United States. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this installment in our live webinar series. Here at POTI, we always strive to bring our students the latest, most up-to-date and current information on peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and related topics. And to that end, we are pleased to host this webinar. Several times each year, we will present to you one of our course authors or a key actor in the peacekeeping field who will discuss a specific topic related to peacekeeping and will answer any questions you may have about the course or the topic. If you would like to participate and submit a question as part of today's live webinar, either through the chat room or by email, please see the instructions at the bottom of your screen. Today, we are pleased to have as our webinar guest, Dr. Anne Jeanette Roska, author of the POTI course, Preventing Violence Against Women and Gender Inequalities in Peacekeeping, and written in cooperation with the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of the Armed Forces. Dr. Roska holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Social Sciences from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She has been an assistant professor at Knox College in Illinois and the University of Colorado Boulder, where she taught courses in social science and feminist theory, research methodologies, and on the cultural study of law, crime, and violence. She has written extensively on human trafficking, bias-related crime, and the use of social science indicators for human rights monitoring. From 2008 to 2010, Dr. Roska served as the director of the United Nations Office of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILPF, in New York. She's also provided expert consultation to such agencies as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, UNICEF, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the Vera Institute of Justice. And so it's my pleasure now to welcome from her office in San Francisco, California, in the United States, Dr. Ann Jeanette Roska. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. When writes a online course, it's, uh, it's a little bit strange to not have a classroom of people to interact with. So. Uh, it's a real honor to get to talk with you for this uh, short period of time today. Uh, I know that some of you have already taken this course, the Preventing Violence Against Women and Gender Inequality in Peacekeeping, uh, but for those of you who haven't, I thought I would just do a quick overview of what that course entails. So if you haven't taken it, you may want to consider uh, taking it now. Um, the course, as, as Harvey said, was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, was written in, in conjunction with the uh, work by the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces. The first part of the course is really uh, basically 
theoretical. It talks about, uh, in, in lesson one, it talks about the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and some of the problems that that come up when one is trying to, to talk about gender inequality without making it seem that all women are the same everywhere uh, or that all women are peaceful and all men are violent. Obviously, those things are not true. Uh, so there's a little bit of a paradox when talking about violence against women that the lesson one tries to explain and, and talk through a little bit. Lesson two offers uh, some extensive definitions of gender and sex and sexuality and how those things are different. Lesson three really tackles the problem of uh, what I call distinction versus discrimination. So uh, when are, if you make a distinction between men and women, are you necessarily discriminating? Uh, you, I don't think you are, but uh, it is sometimes tricky to figure that out. So that lesson talks about some of those challenges. The fourth lesson in the first half of the class is uh, discusses theories of violence, um, how various uh, theorists, social theorists over the, the years and social science folks have defined violence, uh, what people think causes violence, and obviously there are different kinds of violence all over the world and different situations, so <clears throat> sometimes different theories are applicable. So that lesson discusses those issues. In lesson five, uh, the question of cultural relativism is tackled. Uh, sometimes, uh, very often, people are critical of uh, the discourse or the the law of human rights because it comes out of a, a historically comes out of a, a global north western context uh, but things have changed quite a bit over the years and uh, you know international human rights instruments are negotiated by many countries and still the problem of cultural relativism is one that that's real uh, and needs to be uh, thought through carefully so that lesson discusses <clears throat> the issue of culture excuse me um, the second half of the course, lessons six through ten, are much more applied and concrete. Uh, so the first, the first of those, lesson six, is called "Women's Rights Are Human Rights." Uh, that might seem obvious now, but it wasn't always historically. So that talks about the actual international human rights instruments that apply to the issue of gender inequality and women's empowerment. Lesson seven discusses sexual violence and exploitation, particularly in peacekeeping contexts. So. Uh, that's a that's a good one for uh, for looking at the the kind of rules and guidelines that the UN has to prevent sexual exploitation in peacekeeping contexts. Lesson eight is uh, termed institutional violence, and that really talk, talks about uh, poverty, the relationship between gender violence and economic inequality, uh, the vulnerability of women migrant workers in particular, women who have HIV or AIDS, um, and it discusses how their experience of violence has its own unique features. In lesson nine, uh, the topic is the particular kinds of violence that women cope with in situations of conflict and crisis. Uh, so that one is probably of particular interest to people who are working in the field in conflict situations or post-conflict situations. And finally, lesson 10 tries to end on a, a more upbeat note and talks about how uh, women around the world are working to build peace, what women's particular contributions are to peace building, and how they are working with men uh, to improve issues of gender inequality and conflict. So that's just an overview of the course. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to talk a long time today because I really want to hear from you, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about my own approach to the issue of gender, uh, I'm sorry, violence against women and gender inequality. Sometimes I hear from people, you know, why is there all this focus on, on violence against women? You know, there's all kinds of violence. There's race-based violence, there's religious violence, there's violence against people based on caste uh, or other kinds of identities. Um, there's all of those things deserve attention in their own right. There's a lot of attention to violence against women, primarily because that topic was neglected for so long. So in, in many ways, we're making up for lost time. Uh, but I still see there uh, being some challenges and, and troubling areas for me in focusing just on violence against women because I think uh, violence is, uh, is something that, that men and women work to create together. And so I prefer to think of it, uh, the re think of it as a kind of three-part relationship between gender, uh, that is the more cultural aspects of differences between men and women, violence, and inequality. Uh, and that's for three reasons. 
the first reason I see it important to approach it this way is because um, in many contexts, by far, not all, but in many contexts, men are socialized to uh, be more comfortable with violence, to use violence as a way of showing masculinity. Sometimes they're responsible for, uh, very often they're responsible for protecting their countries and militaries, and they're expected to participate in activities that if, if, are, if they're not violent, they can become violent. Uh, whereas women, on the other hand, are socialized uh, to be more mm, better conflict resolvers sometimes. Again, there are wonderful examples of me men who, co who resolve conflict. Uh, one of the things that, I, that the gender approach helps me to, to do is to talk about the ways that women are socialized to not only accept uh, men as violent, but sometimes to teach them how to do that and to encourage it. So I think men and women, again, they, we work together to, to create, a content, create the conditions in which uh, men are expected to, to be more violent generally. Again, I'm speaking in great generalizations. There are many, many differences around the world and in different places. So uh, I'm, think of these as broad generalizations. The second reason I think the gender violence and inequality uh, lens is helpful is because um, not all violence, but a lot of violence can be seen as related to enforcing what are traditional gender norms so that, uh, you know, boys who act in ways that are considered more feminine are often beaten up, uh, if not just made fun of. Uh, men who don't participate who, in, in violence, who say are conscientious objectors from the military, may be considered more feminine, and sometimes things are done to them to discourage that uh, resistance. Uh, women, on the other hand, if they act in ways that are, are, are more physically forceful or, or actively violent, uh, are considered uh, aberrations or um, they're considered not to be real women. Uh, so violence and gender work together in this way that uh, it shows that our gender norms are so important to us that we will use violence to enforce them. Uh, and I think that that's an important piece of this, uh, the, the problem of violence against women and gender inequality that needs to be attended to. And the third reason, finally, that I think the, the trio is important, gender, violence, and inequality, is because <clears throat> in, there's a great deal of social scientific evidence that shows uh, that communities experience more violence or engage in more violence when there is inequality of any kind. Uh, particularly socioeconomic, but gender inequality as well. And, and when there are great inequalities in a society, that's when you're more likely to see violence. Social scientists used to think that uh, communities suffering from poverty uh, would be more violent. But we, know, we now know that it's not poverty per se that produces violence, but great inequality between people in particular communities. And inequality is the thing that is much more likely to produce violence. So it's important to understand that it's not just gender inequality that produces violence, but other kinds of inequality as well. And that's why I like to talk about the, that, that threesome, the, the gender inequality and violence work together. Um, so that's pretty much my approach to, to this topic, um, because the course gives you a, a very good sense of everything I have to say on this topic, or most things. Um, I, I think I'd like to stop talking now and hear from you. Uh, whether you have any questions about this, what you think is important, what issues you think are most pressing to you in your work, uh, and just take the opportunity to hear from you. So I'll turn it back to Harvey to facilitate our conversation. Well, thank you, Anjanette. Uh, I appreciate your summary of the course and also addressing uh, some related issues. Uh, and yes, we do have questions we received from uh, several students, and I'm uh, pleased to read these to you. Uh, the first one is from Gabriella. Uh, she's Romanian and currently deployed uh, at MINUSTA, the UN mission in Haiti, and I note uh, that she is currently enrolled in your course and, and two other courses as well. Here's our question. Here's her question. She says, I work in the police force and I cannot understand the violence against women from other women in the same situation in the workplace. Is yes. this due to jealousy, nature, or an imitation of the male system? It's very interesting that women in such an institution, dominated by men, are not very united. Tell me, do I have the wrong perception, or is there violence against women from women? Gabriella, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, of course, you're not wrong. If you're seeing it, it's there. Uh, 
I think it would depend a lot on the particular situation for to to identify what it is that is <clears throat> excuse me is responsible for this. But um, I think a couple of your your explanations are, are probably appropriate. Um, when f first off, I should say that. Uh, we often have an understanding as women when when we when we identify women as being in a sort of more oppressed category we we think oh well all women should get along or all women should sort of be in this together well women are human and we have conflicts with each other just as we have conflicts with men and men have conflicts with men so the expectation that women are necessarily going to get along uh just because we're women um is is probably one that gets us into some trouble um but i i do think you're right that uh, especially working in a predominantly male or all-male workplace, uh, there are unique pressures on women that produce a conflict between them, if not violence. Uh, so jealousy certainly uh, can be a factor. If women perceive their uh, opportunities for advancement to be more limited, uh, they can sometimes uh, act out against other women in the, in the perception that that will help them professionally. There's also, as you say, the modeling of male behavior. If, if uh, sometimes more masculine behavior traits are are uh, rewarded in the workplace, <clears throat> and women have the perception that unless they demonstrate those uh, those traits, they're not going to advance as, as much. And and there's some data to indicate they're right about that. So there are real pressures on women to to behave in uh, ways we might traditionally associate with masculinity, uh, so conflict and violence and so forth. But again. Uh, yeah, I, I, I personally I shy away from any kind of uh, definition that that attributes violence to nature, uh, and there's a good long explanation for that in the course, but that's for another time. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right to to observe it, and it's good to think about and to help other women to think about why why it is that we engage in that behavior as well. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate it, and now I'll go on to the next question. This is from Pearl in Uganda, and she asks. Uh, please give a clear-cut explanation about women empowerment, since most African women always lived to think that norms or culture have made things the way they are and are almost settling uh, and are and almost settling for the status quo, which is leading them into poverty, gender-based violence, and inequality. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think you're right. Uh, women all over the world, not just in Africa. Uh, we tend to think that the way things are is the way things have to be, uh, and social change is, is difficult. It's uh, it you know it means that you're going to rub up against uh, people who don't want to see things change. Uh, so it's it's challenged. Sometimes it's more comfortable. Sometimes it's easier, and sometimes it's physically safer not to challenge gender norms. Uh, but anytime you want to move toward a, a community, a society that's more rights respecting and equal you're going to have to do a little fighting for it. Um, I hope not violent fighting, but uh, fighting that, you know, that help. One of the things I think is most important actually is, is helping women to feel more comfortable with conflict so that we, we feel we have ways of supporting one another and men have ways of supporting women to, to feel like, you know, it's okay to experience conflict that occurs when, when we're challenging gender norms. Uh, but you asked for a clear-cut definition of women's empowerment. Um, there are actually a number of different uh, theories about that or different definitions. The UN's official definition has five components. Uh, the first one is women's sense of self-worth. So, uh, it's so for a woman to feel empowered, she has to believe that she's, she's worthy. Uh, the second one is the right to have and determine choices. And I see choice is a pretty important thing. For women to feel like they have choices to do whatever it is they want to do, uh, is an important component of, of empowerment. Uh, the third is women's right to have ac equal access to opportunities and resources. This is often tricky in places where there's unequal access to opportunities and resources for lots of people and not just women. Uh, but, you know, if we're focusing on women's empowerment, what we're looking for is a situation in which women's access to resources and power is roughly equal to men's access. The fourth component is the right to have the power to control our own lives. And, and that means both inside our own homes and outside in the world. Uh, women suffer violence in the home more than they do, believe it or not, more than they do even in conflict situations. Uh, so violence in the home is a real problem for, for women. Uh, 
Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't affect men, but it, it affects women at a, a much higher level. Um, finally, the fifth component is women's ability to influence the direction of their society. Uh, their, so this might refer to women being, you know, having uh, be equal representation in governance bodies like legislatures and courts, uh, and also being able to, to be activists and advocates for their own rights. So being able to influence the world in which you live is a very important part of empowerment. So I hope that, that answers your question. Yes, I'm sure that uh, did answer the question. Uh, and now I have another question from Mohammed in Egypt, and I note uh, that he has already completed 15 courses, so congratulations. Uh, and here is his question. Uh, I took your course some time ago, and I still think that the Western brain controls all the views which are related to human rights in general. I also think that we in the East have different views concerning human rights, which are somehow rooted in customs and traditions. My question is, why do we not combine the Eastern views with the Western when we speak about human rights? Uh, Mohammed, that, that's a great question. And uh, I would say you've taken 15 POTI classes. You probably have a, a pretty good sense of this yourself. Um, and if you're seeing this pattern, you know, I would trust your judgment on that. Um, I, I do think, you know, there certainly is a historical emphasis um, in our development of human rights that is, that is dominated by the global north. Um, I do think that there have been a number of uh, participation by, <coughs> excuse me, countries of the global south in uh, helping to shape what counts as human rights, especially economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, and if you, if you did my course, it's probably been too long ago for you to remember the specifics, and certainly I don't remember those specifics, but there is that, that lesson that I talked about on culture and cultural relativism uh, really talks about the ways that uh, uh, norms, customs and norms of human rights uh, in what you're calling the East, uh, so I would say Africa, the ASEAN region, Middle East, there are those, those kinds of norms around human rights, which might not be called human rights, uh, are often woven into, uh, through negotiation at the UN level, into international human rights instruments. So uh, I, I would just you know, I think like when we, when we talk about men and women uh, and, and the problem of overgeneralizing, like all women are this or all men are that, I, I want to say that, that that idea that there's a, a, a Western brain uh, domination or an Eastern way of looking at things, I, I don't find that to be too useful except at the broadest, most general abstract level. Because uh, certainly I find myself to be quite different from other folks in the United States, as I'm sure you see differences between yourself and uh, the communities in which you live. Nobody, you know, in any given country or context, we don't all think alike. Uh, so I think it, it can be misleading. <coughs> really, excuse me, I seem to have some sort of frog in my throat today. Um, it can be misleading to, to talk about this sort of east-west dichotomy as though, you know, everybody's the same on each side. And I'm sure you didn't actually mean mean that, that that would be too simplistic. But, uh, and I, I want to respect the fact that you're seeing a kind of a pattern of, uh, what you're calling Western domination, but um, I, I think if we look closer and any time we look at specifics, it gets a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but I would encourage you to go back and look at that lesson on, on culture versus rights in, in the POTI course, because uh, I think it, you might find it uh, addresses this a, a bit more. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and here is the next question from uh, Qatan uh, from Yemen and currently deployed at the uh, UN assistance mission in Darfur, UNAMID. Um, and she serves as uh, police. Uh, and here's the question. Uh, what is the difference between sex and gender? Um, you would think that's a simple question, wouldn't you? Um, thank you for the question. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sort of quick and dirty uh, definition that, that we often use. Uh, that is, sex is those features of uh, biology and nature which we're born with. Uh, so, you know, female genitalia, reproductive organs, uh, male genitalia and reproductive organs, uh, and that those things are sex uh, and they're natural. And typically we understand those things to be fairly unchanging, uh, whereas gender is what we think of as those aspects of sex norms and gender roles that are more cultural, that our societies have decided are appropriate for us. So 
you can look across societies and see major differences in what men and women are expected to do. So uh, it might be appropriate uh, for, uh, for women to engage in work in one place that is not appropriate for them in another, and same goes with men. Um, so that's the sort of oversimplistic uh, definition. Uh, as research has advanced, we now know that, uh, that there are aspects of gender, uh, sorry, sorry, culture, like our social behavior, that can have effects on biology, like it, it can change gene expression in a woman's pregnancy so that uh, the mix of sex hormones in her fetus can change actually as a result of certain things in the environment uh, so that we think of as more cultural and vice versa. There are certain things um, uh, that we think of as more cultural, uh, like sexuality, that uh, you know seem pretty natural, pretty hardwired. So uh, one one thing I always say is uh, if if sexuality, uh, heterosexuality versus homosexuality or bisexuality or even asexuality, if those things are cultural or choice, uh, then we wouldn't have anybody who's not heterosexual because all of the social norms are toward heterosexuality. So the fact that we have there is homosexuality in every society on earth and in every animal species leads me to think that there are certain things about nature that you know culture really isn't capable of just transforming. Uh, so that's why I think the, the definition is a little bit more complicated than simply sex is nature and gender is culture, but that's a good shorthand for understanding the difference. Thanks for that. And here's our next question from Samuel in Nigeria. Uh, and he's actually a student at the University of Medjugorje, if I pronounced it correctly. Uh, and here's his question. In peacekeeping operations, peacekeepers are encouraged to work and respect the culture of their environment. How would peacekeepers cope if the culture has elements that encourage gender inequality? That, that's the question of the century, Samuel. Thank you for it. Um, there is, there's no one simple answer to that question. Um, it is it is, of course, very important to respect the, the norms of one's host, uh, host country, wherever you're working. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, you also have an obligation as a peacekeeper. I don't know if you're a peacekeeper, but uh, peacekeepers, UN personnel, have an obligation to, to respect and uh, create the conditions for enforcement of international human rights norms. And when there's a conflict between local cultural practice and international human rights norms, uh, typically, and I want to make a general rule, but typically the international human rights norm needs to be the highest one. There are ways to, you know, you need to, you need, for instance, if uh, uh, it's very normal for people to be quite violent to children in a particular society, um, the international human rights norm, because there's a, there are treaties to protect children's rights, the Convention of Child Rights, for instance, um, the UN's responsibility is to uphold those practices. Uh, even against local cultural norms. But there are ways to do that that are more culturally respecting than others. Uh, mo every culture has, and first off, divergences within it. Uh, so there are going to be people within the culture who disagree with practices like gender inequality or, or uh, violence against women or violence against children. Um, and if you can identify those elements, those the parts of society that that are troubled by the kinds of practices that, that you see as troubling, that are in violation of human rights, uh, working with them is very important because they are part of that culture too. Uh, there's no unified single culture anywhere. Uh, there are always kind of differences and conflicts within cultures, and it's important to kind of look at what are the values within any given society that are actually consistent with international human rights, even if actual practice seems to violate it. Uh, that's a, a much more complicated and long topic, uh, so I, I encourage you to look at the, the course, the cultural uh, culture versus rights section of the course, um, but also if you have other questions, I'll give my email address at the end so you can reach out and we can uh, discuss it a bit further. Thanks for that, and here's the next question uh, from Isidore in Nigeria. And she asks, I would be very grateful if you would tell me how I can get the full course material on preventing violence against women and gender inequality in peacekeeping. I have already viewed the samples provided online. Well, I think uh, I'll answer that question myself, if I may. Sure. Uh, and, and the answer, Isidore, is uh, go to our website, www.peaceupstraining.org. 
uh, go from there to the student classroom. If you're already a student, then you're aware of that. If you're not yet a student, just uh, uh, become a student. You can click there. Uh, and within the student classroom, you can enroll and download the full course. So um, thank you for asking. Um, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, this one is uh, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Leon, uh, and he asked the following. Uh, in the community where I'm working, two main causes of sexual violence were identified, customs and retrograde beliefs. According to these beliefs, youngsters believe that if they have sexual relations with minors, they will become rich and could find precious stones as they are working and living in a mining zone. How can we fight against these two main causes and also a third cause, unemployment, because in order to prevent violence against women, we must tackle or cope with these causes. I actually saw this question in advance, and you know, I think I might have misinterpreted it the first time around. You're, you're saying that youngsters uh, engage, uh, believe this, uh, or, or people in, in the society you're talking about uh, believe that sex with youngsters will bring uh, uh, access to, to wealth uh, in the form of jewels uh, or other valuables. And I think I misread it at first and thought that you were saying uh, men uh, think that if they have sex with young girls, that's true. And it might, and I assumed it wasn't true in reverse. And actually, I don't know enough about uh, Nigeria to, to tell you, to, to respond knowing whether or not there's gender inequality there. Um, very often there is in societies a, a, a difference in belief about men's sexuality versus women's sexuality, that uh, men are rewarded for multiple sexual encounters, sex with younger people, uh, whereas women tend not to be. And again, this is an overgeneralization. There are countries in which this is, I don't know if it's reversed, but certainly that women have more equality in this front. Um, I would tend to look at, uh, first off, the importance of bringing to uh, cultural context um, an understanding of what the facts are. Uh, so sometimes people just carry around myths because they don't know any better and they don't actually, uh, unless there's actual evidence of people getting lots of jewels for having sex with youngsters, and, and somehow I doubt that, uh, then it's, you know, pointing the fact out that that's not actually true can sometimes, you know, just be helpful. Um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes people believe in things in spite of the absence of evidence. Um, so in that case, I would look at more what the symbolic underpinnings are of the belief uh, what is it about uh, gender relations uh, or age relations, age differences in the society that's creating the idea that, uh, you know, it, it is status enhancing, if not wealth enhancing, to, to have sex with young people. And again, I would appeal to, to people within that society who might have trouble with that practice and ask them what are values that maybe everybody shares that would be in contrast to or would challenge this belief about uh, having sex with youngsters to to get wealth. Um, you also talked about unemployment. I think uh, unemployment and economic inequality, as I mentioned in the beginning, are are absolutely essential to to address. Um, they are intertwined with gender inequality. There are some places where men are struggling more economically than women, although the majority is the other way around. Women women struggle more economically. Um, but economic inequality is a huge problem. It leads to a lot of violence. Uh, whether or not it's related to gender. And uh, you're absolutely right that unemployment needs to be addressed. Thank you for that. And um, here's the next question from Garindra in India. Uh, I'm sorry, I, can't, I couldn't quite hear you there. Yeah. Uh, Garindra is the name of the person submitting the question from India. Uh, and this is a troubling question, but let me read it. He writes, uh, with due respect and regards, I wish you for your success in this training initiative. I have been a victim of such violence. I am an unfortunate father of the deceased whose 24 years genius daughter was coldly murdered and faced dowry death on 25 January 2010 after 45 days of her social marriage. I'm having many questions in my mind, untold to anyone, living for the sake of saving more girls and women on this earth. Otherwise, there is no wish to live after such a tragic loss of my beloved one. 
So even before I uh, pose the question to you um, and Je Jeanette, let me uh, express my uh, gratitude uh, and sympathy uh, to the uh, person, to the gentleman who posed this question and for uh, sharing the situation with us. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and Jeanette, I'll, I'll let you answer the question. You have my questions as well. Uh, that's a terrible, terrible thing to have to, to experience. Um, and you're, you're certainly not alone, I'm sure. Um, I, the first question I would have is whether there are uh, any support groups available or that perhaps you might be interested in forming yourself for other fathers who've gone through this experience, fathers and mothers, uh, the, the, the murder of a, a young person uh, and a daughter is, is a devastating, devastating loss. Um, and I think you're right that fighting against it to try to prevent that sort of thing in the future is, is a good way to, to help oneself recover and, and to deal with grief and to, to feel like uh, the, the death of your daughter can have some meaning. Um, we, you know, words sort of fail me. It's, it's, there's not really anything uh, sufficient to say in the face of such a tragedy. Uh, but, I, but I really commend you, and I think you're very brave and uh, a compassionate person to, to want to, to turn this tragedy into making the, the world a better place for women and girls. Uh, and again, we'll put my email at, up, my, I'll tell you my email address at the end, and if there are resources that I know about, um, or I can think of people who you might contact, I'll certainly provide those. Uh, but thank you so much for submitting your comment. Yes, thank you for submitting that comment, that question, and uh, thank you, Anjanette, for, for answering it. Uh, the next question is from Oyvid in Norway. He has a bit of a long introduction and then the question. Here it is. Uh, first, let me thank you, Dr. Anjanette Roska, for your job on the POTI course, Preventing Violence Against Women and Gender Inequalities in Peacekeeping. This is maybe the most important issue when it comes to success criteria for UN peacekeeping, at least seen from my perspective. In Norway, we have developed what we call operational monitoring teams. And one of their tasks is to look into the demographic uh, in a mission area of operations and see how this should reflect on mission operational concept. How do we operate an environment with gender inequality in the best way for the civilian population and for the mission? This could have impact on how we put together units, use of gender advisors, and so on. To utilize this information, it will hopefully reduce the violence against the women and children in the conflict, in the conflict area, and also utilize the potential these people have to restore lasting peace. And then he says, here is my question. Uh, I just want to hear your views on how the leadership in UN peacekeeping operations handles this type of challenge and how your course will help the peacekeepers in this regard. That's a, a, a big question, um, and I'm sorry, I missed your name. Harvey, would you mind telling me that again? Oyvid. Oyvid. Uh, thank you for the question, Oyvid, and, and for your observations, which are, seem very sound to me. Um, I'm not really the best person to ask, uh, to, to evaluate how the UN is dealing with gender inequality in peacekeeping situations because I, I'm an outsider. I think folks, in, unless, unless I've been asked to actually look very carefully myself uh, at specific programs, um, I, I would feel uncomfortable making a judgment one way or the other. Uh, I do know that, that women uh, who, who do that work, who evaluate how the UN is doing, think that there's a long way to go. Um, and uh, I haven't seen anything to, to change my mind about that. But I also think there are a number of very fine uh, peacekeepers, peace support operations personnel who are working very hard to improve gender inequality. Um, so I'm sorry, Harvey, would you mind repeating just the question portion of that? Yes, his question is this. Uh, I just want to hear your views on how the leadership in UN peacekeeping operations handles this type of challenge, and how your course will help the peacekeepers in this regard? Well, my hope is that, going to the second part of the question, my hope is that the course uh, introduces uh, those who take it to uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, which is a really powerful resolution that all countries now, uh, or most countries, have, have adopted. And 
it calls on the one hand for recognizing the unique challenges and violations that women face in conflict and post-conflict situations, but more importantly, on the second hand, it, it talks about the importance of involving women in peace-building operations at every level, so all the way up to the highest negotiating level. Uh, it's not because all women think alike or all women are necessarily better at peace, peace thinking than, than men are, or peace negotiating, but, but uh, due to socialization, women do have some special talents in this area, and, and also they represent more than half the population. So if there are not women engaged in the highest levels of, of policy making and uh, peace building operations, then uh, those operations are, are going to be lacking. Um, so I, the course, I think, will help people to understand what the, what the legal obligations are of countries that have adopted 1325 and, and maybe have not yet fully implemented them. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I think it will help. It raises these kinds of difficult questions about what do you do when international human rights norms seem to conflict with local cultural norms, how to think about that. Uh, and so those kinds of tools, I think, are very helpful. I've gotten feedback from people that, that they found the course helpful for that reason. It also gives a lot of really excellent examples, many of them gathered by the Democratic Control of Armed Forces group, that uh, show how women have been and are involved in, in peace building, whether or not it's through the UN. Uh, there are some good examples in the course of the UN doing well in this area, uh, and so the, I think that's always important to know about. Uh, so I would encourage people to, to look at the course uh, and also to, to be familiar with both aspects of section, uh, Security Council Resolution 1325. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you for that uh, answer. And thank you also for mentioning uh, the topic of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. We actually have a total of uh, four courses in this general area. Uh, one is the course that we're discussing now, Prevention of Violence Against Women. Uh, we have a second course, uh, Gender Perspectives in Peacekeeping Operations. Uh, and then we have two courses, actually, on the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325. So all of these are on our website, and uh, thank you, uh, Anjanette, for, for mentioning those. The uh, next question is from James in Kenya. He's uh, currently serving in MINUSCO, the UN mission in the Congo, and uh, he asks a straightforward question. How do we encourage women to speak up when they are oppressed? Um, that's a great question, James. Thank you so much for it. Uh, and I think men who want to work against gender inequality uh, are are absolutely essential to to ensuring we reach gender equality. Um, first thing that men can do is ask the question you just asked, so thank you for that. Um, uh, I would say the second, the second thing is when women are present in an environment, if we're talking about uh, inequality in the workplace or inequality even in the amount of talking going on in a meeting, if women are present, it's important and helpful if men make space for them. Uh, first, by letting them know that you want to hear what they're what they have to say. You want to hear their voices in the room. And then sometimes the hardest and, and, and in fact, most important thing to do is for men to just be quiet. Uh, and that, that's really um, uncomfortable for many of us to, to just be quiet in a room. And sometimes there might be silence for a while. If women are unaccustomed to uh, participating in a, in a political process or a, a meeting, um, it might take them a while to, to gather their own confidence. Uh, to, to speak. Sometimes that's not true. I mean, I'm, I talk rapidly in any environment, but some people have need a little bit more time to gather their thoughts, and if there's a lot of talking going on, they, they can't do that um, just because the, the custom has been for women not to speak as much. So it's a very important, helpful thing to do to just make space by being quiet, but also by letting women know you want to hear what they have to say. Um, then the third thing is, if women are not present, uh, and are not taking place, if they're not being engaged in peace building processes or any kind of programming, um, it's important to talk to decision makers uh, in that situation and, and your colleagues about the fact that women's voices are not being heard and that, that you're missing something really important uh, by not making room for those voices. Um, sometimes uh, peacekeepers have talked about, or peace support folks have talked about, you know, making a space for women and then women don't even show up. So the first thing to do, if that's the case, is to go and ask them why, what, what's happening. Sometimes it's as simple as 
uh, meetings are being held, nego- you know, sort of uh, community meetings are being held at the time that all women need to go get water from a well somewhere, or they're more responsible for, for children, or women who are training to be in a militia. Uh, they have training at that time, and so they're not able to come to an event that maybe a UN operation has, has set up. So if, if women aren't showing up, it's important to ask them why and not just assume that they don't want to participate. Um, the second thing I'd say about that uh, is that in almost every setting, you're going to find women, civil society, or non-governmental organizations that exist. And it's important to incorporate them to make sure that their voices are, are officially incorporated into any kind of program planning uh, and you know, local operations that the UN is doing. Uh, very often they're not not included. When you include a lot of extra voices, it can make things a little bit harder. To it takes 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 longer to have more voices heard. Uh, but ultimately, you'll have better programming as a result. And then finally, uh, regardless of whether or not there are organized groups uh, of women doing doing work for gender and equi- gender equality, um, make sure that people in your team are talking to women. Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable doing it, or you feel that that they wouldn't be comfortable talking to you. Find somebody who can talk to them. Usually you can find some sort of intermediary figure who uh, might be more comfortable talking to local women. Uh, make sure you have you might have to bend over backwards to, to make room for, for women's voices because historically that room has not existed and uh, people need to, to really know that it's going to be safe for them to express their opinions and that their opinions are actually going to have an impact. It's not enough to just say, we want to hear your opinion and then not do anything in, resu- in, in reaction to hearing that opinion. You have to actually take those opinions into account and, and allow them to influence whatever programming you're doing. And that, as we discussed earlier, is part of women's empowerment, is making sure that women's voices have uh, the ability to influence change around them. But thank you so much for the question, James. Yes, thank you, uh, James, for that question. And uh, thank you, Anjanette, for that answer. Uh, And for all the answers, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for specific questions. Uh, I know we still have a few questions that we have not been able to have time to respond to, uh, but we will forward those to uh, Ann Jeanette uh, for her to respond to by email. And if any of you have questions in the future, of course, you can go to our website uh, and email through the course author email section. So we welcome that. So um, I invite you, uh, uh, and Jeanette, if you have any uh, closing comments or thoughts uh, uh, for today. I appreciate your answering the questions, and, and uh, I welcome any concluding thoughts you have. Thanks, Harp. Uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you all for participating in this webinar. It is a real honor to talk with you. The work you do is tremendously important, and it, uh, I think it's a great time for the world that you're interested in issues of violence against women and gender inequality, and I'm really glad that you're taking the time out of your days to participate here. Um, my email address, which uh, the POTI folks will put up on the website about this webinar, is A. Roska. so my last name is R O S. G-A at transpositions.org. So I won't bother to spell all that out. It will be on the website. Please feel free to email me questions. If they're, if they're long and I don't have time to answer them in detail, I'll let you know that. But sometimes I can point you toward other resources, and I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your time, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to chat with you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anjanette Roska. We appreciate your time, expertise, and your ongoing efforts for peace and the prevention of violence against women. And to our students and viewers, thank you for your excellent questions and for participating in this webinar. This session will be archived on our website and available to students for future viewing. I'm Harvey Langholz the Executive Director of the Peace Operations Training Institute. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your continued participation in our live webinar series. Thank you for viewing this webinar. We are pleased to bring this webinar to you, and we invite you to view our website to see all the programs and courses we offer. If you would like to view the archived version of this webinar or any of our previous webinars, please visit www.peaceopstraining.org forward slash webinars. They are also available on our YouTube channel. We thank our students worldwide serving on peacekeeping missions. 
the Peace Operations Training Institute is dedicated to serving you.